Factions of the Rhinosphere, written by John Arcto. Uh, this guy has made a bunch of different little categories for people he views as being on the right. And uh, this is his introduction to his overview of these various groups. So he says, As an absolute autist who is obsessed with semantical precision and categorization, I am going to have a shot at categorizing the factions of the Third New Right and Dissident Right, both of which, in addition to a few other movements, I will collectively term the Rightosphere. Um, Alex Kashuda, Paywald, N.S. Lyons, and Keith Woods have done this already, giving their observations as to the different tendencies, as have woke outlets like Salon, Discourse Magazine, and The Unpopulist. But I feel I have a fresh perspective that I would like to share. As a short summary, as a, as a, as a short summary, whilst both the Third New Right and the Dissident Right are responses to mainstream conservatism's powerlessness in the face of wokeism, the Third New Right is more institutionalist and believes that the current liberal democratic structures can be reformed, inspired by the example of Viktor Orban's Hungary. Meanwhile, the dissident right is more explicitly anti-institutionalist and wants to replace liberal democracy with more authoritarian systems, though they differ as to what it should be replaced with and how to get there. I see the movements as very much linked with the post-to-policy phenomena, a recognition that conservative elites are engaging with online dissident right content. This is, this is definitely true. Uh, I, you posted, I, I saw this on X, but you, uh, um, big cheese, you posted the Hurtisu Yarvinu influencing, uh, JD Vance. So we're getting somewhere. <laughs> that was iconic. Hurtisu well, Yarvin is, at this point, he's a mainstream intellectual, at least on the right. Uh, he probably has a not so inconsiderable influence on the left. I mean, he is a Democrat. I'd say he's still a little obscure. I wouldn't quite call him mainstream. Um, not an anymore. As mainstream, mainstream, as mainstream as the right. right. As, as mainstream as like a modern right wing uh, intellectual can get. Um, I, I agree. I see these movements as very much linked with the post to policy phenomenon. Uh, recognition that conservative elites are engaging with online dissident right content. Chris Rufo and the Claremont Institute have been in extensive communication with the dissident right, bringing people like Bronze Age pervert to mainstream conservative audiences. Outlets like I Am 1776, I think I remember this one. Oh yeah, and The American Mind, I remember that too. Play a role as a bridge between the third new right and dissident right. There are some other movements I will discuss here, parts of the rightosphere that I wouldn't call either third right or dissident right, but their own thing. I do not define them as dissident right because that is mostly used for offshoots from neo-reactionary thinkers like Curtis Jarvin and Nick Land, who similarly emphasize elite theory. This is kind of the school of thought that I come from. Um, even Bronze Age pervert, whose focus is quite different to the neo-reactionaries, became famous through Jarvin, linking him to the dissident right movement. However, there also exist tendencies such as the Groypers, the Manosphere, and remnants of the 2010s alt-right, the last of which I will call the neo-alt-right. These have different emphases and origins, with uh, not much overlap in terms of their circles with the bulk of the dissident right, though they claim the term as their own, hence my drawing the distinction. Who won't be included? To be part of the rightosphere, you must agree with the following. Wokeism, definition here, is more than just a passing fad. I agree with that. It is not an innocent misunderstanding of true liberalism by immature college students or something that can be debated away. I agree with that. It is thoroughly embedded within every institution in the Anglosphere, showing that there is something deeply and fundamentally wrong with politics and society as it stands. I agree with that. Woke activists will not be persuaded, as they are ideological fanatics for whom cancel culture has worked. I agree with that. Therefore, excuse me. Therefore, Radical action is required to either fight them politically or build parallel institutions and wait for their hegemony to collapse of its own contradictions. I agree with that. 
Um, so <laughs> yeah, guess I'm part. Guess we're on this bandwagon. Give the definition of wokeness. Huh? The definition of wokeness. Uh, I don't know. We can we can get into that later. Um, I think I think we could, we should just confine this to a um rightosphere video, and then we can talk about woke in another one. Um, but I I think he's pretty much given a good credo. Yes, a good yes, summary yes. here of of you know we all kind of know what we're talking about even though our definitions might differ um there are a couple of groups that people may think should be mentioned but the intellectual dark web idw gender critical and maga movements won't be included i will explain why for each intellectual dark web the intellectual dark web is represented by people like james Lindsay, cringe intelligent but still cringe helen pluck rose don't know who she is Brett Weinstein, know who he is. Sam Harris, he's a liberal. Barry Weiss, vaguely familiar. Constantine Kissin, vaguely familiar. An organization. Yeah, that's the uh, He's a what? That's, yeah, that's, is that the, that's the, like, yeah, that's the Russian guy uh, whose family escaped like the Soviet Union and then, as it was collapsing, it was basically bought up like a bunch of formerly state-owned stuff. Hmm. Okay. Organizations like Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, never heard of that, and Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Um, some figures within the IDW label, like Jordan Peterson, are nominally on the right. However, they are still fundamentally liberals. They believe that institutions subscribing to extreme transgenderism and critical race theory can be engaged with through open debate and a milder form of liberalism often described as 90s liberalism, but I would go further and say Obama-era liberalism, can be restored simply by persuading misguided woke activists. But this group will always swing back towards the left whenever there are tendencies that threaten to go further than Obama liberalism. I agree with that. You can see this most clearly with Jordan Peterson in my mind. Um, I think Peterson has a... Like a like much a wider problem. problem. I think he's just the man falling apart yeah, in every well, way possible. possible. He he is the the issue with him is he has some some severe contradictions at the, at the core of his personality, um, and is also yeah. probably being probably receiving, uh, probably receiving money from certain non-American agents, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Well, because he's he, 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 been red red him some, some stuff. stuff so. Yeah. Well, he's very. Uh, He's he has a contrarian type personality, but he also is fundamentally agreeable. So he has all these opinions, also, and then he, he basically some, can't uh, he can't deal with the blowback he gets from them. And I think this has sort of damaged his psyche. Yeah, you can correct me if these are like conspiracy theories, but like there's um, wasn't he in some like climatological studies involving Canada and the U.S. I back wouldn't be surprised. If, I wouldn't be surprised if he was. Yeah. Um. He's right about cleaning your room, but he is still very much uh, squishy on a lot of issues. Um, but this group will always... Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, FIRE and even Jordan Peterson have attacked Chris Rufo's higher education reforms, seeing free speech and anti-cancel culture as goods in and of themselves and having no deeper analysis of cultural hegemony and the impossibility of completely neutral institutions. Yeah. This is the this is probably the main one of the big things that kind of uh makes um makes them uh centrists essentially is they still believe that you can have a neutral institution, which is ridiculous. Uh the fact that the pendulum never swung against woke like they said it would, with the anti SJW movement completely failing, crushed by big tech censorship and Gen Z getting ever more woke, discredited this tendency in the eyes of many. James Lindsay is the one one of those people who's promoting this idea that there'll be some sort of big pendulum swing the opposite way that's uh, engineered by the elites, which is just com a completely ridiculous. Uh, wokeness, wokeness is, is very deep. I deeply. think it is. What was that? I I think there is a swing coming because we're seeing. Uh, well, well, there's a there's a. It's swing. not. It's not. Yeah. It's. I don't think it's radicalization. It's, I think yeah. that the, the left is just. It keeps going and going, and eventually it's gonna. The, their radicalization is going to form a faction on the right that is, uh, or even in the center, they're just not going to be able to follow. 
and like well, we can call that the pendulum swing if that yeah, well, counts. Yeah, well, but but okay, I I agree with you in that sense. But I'm saying that like I think there is a pen there in that sense there is a pendulum swing, but it's not something that was sort of engineered or predicted by some sort of organized elite. It's it's very much no, uh like it's very much. I doubt it's gonna it's be gonna engineered. engineered. I, I doubt it's gonna be engineered. But once it picks up steam, I think some uh, fra uh, factions in the elite are going to uh try to hitch themselves on it. Yeah, but, well, because the issue is he's also pinning the sort of um, uh, uh, liberal out, liberal sort of progressive left outrage over the Gaza situation as part of this pendulum swing, and I'm like, I just do not see that as uh, as being engineered. I think it's completely a joke. Uh, and I think James Lindsay is a little bit of a clown for suggesting that, but I think um, James Lindsay probably went like, uh, a bit too far on the like the deep end. Talking well, he, about like Gnosticism and uh and like communist connections to that and wokeism. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing too is there's 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 like uh, understand like like liberals are not your average liberal is not reading Pistis Sophia. Like there are definite clear <laughs> parallels and tendencies that you could say are Gnostic in a certain sense, but I mean after a certain point there isn't a clear easy historical link between Christianity and like historical Gnosticism. So, uh, you know, calling liberalism or leftism Gnosticism is like, it's rhetorically effective in some ways, but then very disingenuous in others. Um, Gnosticism is the kind of idea that's it's easy to stumble into independent of any past thought. Like, uh, it's, it's basically what if God but evil. Yeah. You know, it's like a first grade fan fiction prompt <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah it's uh i i don't know how much of that i i believe in but uh you know that there, there's some fishy stuff going on there um all right let's see um well, and and also they're sort of not acknowledging that that wokeness is like this. And as I've said, as I covered in my last video, this is like a wokeness is embedded in the structure. Uh, there are like structural incentives for Western society to be woke, if you know what I mean. It's not a trend. It's not a fad. There, it might sort of be scaled back at certain times if it, uh, you know, if it accelerates too quickly. But it, this is like a feature and not a bug. Uh, it's not oh, just going to go away. Yeah, it. I, I think it will go away just because it's unsustainable. It's going to fall apart. It's going to fall apart. Well, it's um, a bit, it's a bit of a different. This is it's a bit of a different claim than a lot of people are saying now, because um, yeah. they'll they'll say like, oh, wokeness. Is, like it, they think like there'll be a left and a right in the future, and that the left like won't be woke. Not that leftism is so self-immolating that it'll eventually just uh, cause the system to collapse in on itself. Um, it's not that it's uh, the, problem the problem isn't the self immolation. The problem, the problem is that it's a uh, it's a parasitic it's belief. belief. It uh, it doesn't be produced by itself, itself by itself. And because of that, it needs to draw upon uh, upon the elements of the right that are sympathetic to its cause. But then in doing so, doing so, it depletes any future potential of like that faction. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, here's, here's something I've noticed waxing in prominence. Um, the gender critical movement, the gender critical movement, also known as the TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists are a diverse range of people, predominantly women. Some are woke on every other issue with the only thing uniting them with the right being mild criticism of transgender ideology when it conflicts with women's rights. A notable representative here is JK Rowling, who is in no way part of the right. And the fact that she is often seen uh, as such only proves Mac McIntyre's neocon cycle, which is basically where people are continually discarded from the left for basically disagreeing with one uh, critical JK issue. J.K. Rowling isn't even against trans people. She she just hates men. <laughs> yeah, like she's she's fine with a woman transitioning into men, but like uh, other than that, like it's. The the only problem are men go becoming women. Like that's that's her one hiccup, and uh, 
or like or like That's men men becoming women and then demanding access to women's spaces really um yeah a friend of mine who is a turf recently informed me about the turf wars on one side of this divide was the more woke inclined members of the movement such as jk rowling and kathleen stock not sure who that is who still believe in using preferred pronouns as a courtesy and who really are only concerned with single sex pra- spaces sex based rights and child transition on the other side are uh represented by people like megan murphy posey parker and the publication redux are oh oh i'm actually by the way um oh hold on hold on i have a good um crap I have a good example of the per- of people who are on the uh, latter side. I'll have to find the channel again real quick. Dude, was it already deleted? Hold on. Wait, who are you for? I'm trying to find someone. Maybe the channel was deleted by now. That'd be crazy. This can't be happening. Dude, it's already gone. No way. Bro. Well, I've got to be way more careful about what I say on YouTube. Because I can't find this. Maybe I... I know. Who are you looking for? Well, I was looking for this... um. What do you call it? Uh, turf channel. But now I can't find it, so it seems like it's been deleted. Not sure what happened there. Yeah, it's, it's possible. That's disturbing. Grim prospects for my YouTube channel. I mean, to be, you know, on the upside, my uh, my baby alien video was restored. So, you know, still deeply disquieting. Um, anyway. Um, where were we? On the other side, represented by people like Megan Murphy, Posey Parker, and their publication Redux, are those that believe that the transgenderist manipulation of language, of which pronouns are an extremely prominent example, are the core means of how the ideology projects its power over society. My friend is definitely in the latter camp. However, the hardline TERFs base their opposition to transgenderism uh, more on a general hatred of patriarchy. Well, yeah, they always say that this is like patriarchy you know, that, that uh, transgender ideology is like a a new development of patriarchy, which I've always thought to be wrong. Um, yeah, but that is... Um, those those are the main support base for the TERFs, just like uh, women who have a problem with men trying to claim uh, status as women. women. Yeah. Um, however, pure, uh, some like Mary Harrington and Louise Perry started as TERFs, but became part of the brightosphere. However, pure TERFism is fundamentally a culturally left-wing ideology and their correct stances on transgenderism do not merit inclusion in and of themselves as they are built on very different reasoning. I agree with that. Uh, finally, for com- just, what was that? The TERFs are going to... No, just quickly, like the turfs, I, I think they're gonna die out eventually. Um, I I think they may have some sort it, of stronghold in the UK because it's colloquially referred mm. to by transgender activists as Turf Island. So I I they, uh, they, that's so that's that's they, solely because of JK Rowling, not and nothing, nothing else. else. I don't think so. Um, I've noticed that I noticed there are a lot of turfs that do seem to come mm. from the UK. They must have some sort of stronghold. Uh, in an institution or two there. I don't think it's isolated to J.K. Rowling. 
not impossible. Not impossible. Um, but I, I agree. I think they're eventually going to wane in influence ultimately. Although I think there will still be a, a current of, of turfness. Because also there will always be lesbians who are simply like, you know, not down with whatever is going on. Um, anyway, final plea for common sense. The IDWs and the turfs play a role similar to that played by Father Gapon in the 1905 Russian Revolution, leading to the establishment to sort out its ugliest aspects through its own logic and framing, that being the divinity of the Tsar in the early 20th century, century Russia, and the civil rights left liberalism in the 2010s Anglosphere. However, the waves of big tech censorship and ever greater radicalization of wokeism in society exposed their mild pleas for common sense as totally insufficient to deal with a powerful and ruthless enemy. There have been too many bloody Sundays for these factions to have any credibility left. MAGA, the last notable absence from this series is MAGA. I am not including it because it is not an ideology, but simply a personality cult. That's rude. Don't even call it that. Sound like a liberal. Around it's, Donald it's, Trump. Fundamentally, it is true. I think that... Um, that's still a pejorative. 80 to 90, that, that's, that's still a pejorative. Yeah, yes, but it's it's not wrong. 80 to 90% of the people who are in the MAGA, like self-proclaimed at least, uh, do not follow it for any like specific... Uh, ideological reason but because it's it's like trump's party or like yeah, trump's well, movement he, he is he is a strong man in that sense but still like we we know what the word cult uh the, the sort yeah, of emotions yeah. and reactions that it that entails uh so i feel like the use here is inappropriate um many of trump's most fanatical supporters i would classify as belonging to the conspiracy theorist fraction particularly um q followers some are more intellectual but the more well-educated trump activists tend to see trump more as a vehicle for their own ideology rather than have a religious devotion to the man himself i guess that we would fall in that camp pretty much um most probably pretend to believe in the full version of the big lie as a political maneuver like jd vance um i mean i i i am i don't i don't pretend i actually do believe uh but we won't get into any more of that here because that's a little bit uh a little bit taboo a little bit verboten so we'll move on to the next article which is factions of the rightosphere the post-liberals these are the four types of post-liberals according to john arcto uh british post-liberalism catholic new De catholic new dealism populist christian democracy and high integralism the okay this this last one, these really these last two, like this kind of seems contrived, um, and like not a real faction. But we'll see what he has to say. If the icons themselves are anything to go by, these are like uh, this is gonna be Democrats who just want who who want everything that the Democratic Party stands for, but uh, they want like the cross on the wall instead of the. Like the painting of Kamala Harris or whatever their leader gets elected, in quotes. I guess so. We'll we'll see. We'll have to look into where he goes with this. One of the major groups of the third new right are the post liberals. This group can be broadly described as communitarian, anti individualist, economically left leaning, and socially conservative to varying degrees. Hmm, I might fall in this camp, although I'm definitely not Catholic. Uh, post liberals have a high degree of establishment respectability with them being able to write for mainstream liberal news outlets and have access to elite circles that no other group within the right sphere would have. <laughs> it's definitely not me. Um, this is because the post-liberals stay away from the topic of race, focusing on vibe-based platitudes like community cohesion and the importance of family. Very watered down in that sense. Uh, when they are a little bit more spicy in regards to social issues, they're able to cover up their uh, homophobia with their predominantly Catholic religion. Yeah, see, this is this is also why the sort of trad cath position is is fundamentally safe. Is fundamentally safe. It's because of the institutional power and credibility that, that the Catholic Church has. Um, Church Pro Protestants, Protestants do like not. Pro always, yeah. Protestants do not get this. Uh, do not experience the same leniency. Um, that has always been far more respectable than yeah. the secular. What? 
there is going to be a problem where uh, Protestantism is seen as the more gay one, I guess, I guess. just because uh, more Protestants have gone atheist, I think, and there are like official Protestant churches which like fully and openly endorse all the all like the all of the postmodern post stuff. stuff. Uh, I, but I Catholics mean, aren't really that much better. Like the, I, I I don't know if he was open about it, but there's a lot of. There's a lot of very good evidence to suggest like that the current Pope is a, a communist He's or at least like a Jesuit. Marxist or another. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it, well, and the Catholic Church has been subverted like so many times by the left. It's it's like no longer funny. Well, the, well, the thing is too that um, what do you call it? Uh, like your average Catholic in America is actually more left wing than your average evangelical. And these sort of uh, woke churches that you see getting posted everywhere online mm -hmm. are really just the remaining mainline churches, which are absolutely hemorrhaging members. So um, the, and they, they're, those institutions have been taken over by liberals. I remember I, I had I planned a video on like Redeem Zoomer and his whole thing is like, oh, we're going to take back the mainline churches, blah, blah, blah in the same sort of vein as the whole uh, trad calf movement online wanted to get a, a based reactionary traditionalists, whatever, to uh, take back the Catholic Church, if you will, and that would be the best way to conserve tradition. Uh, he's, he's kind of doing the same thing, but with mainline Protestantism, um, redeem Zoomer is. But both of these movements will ultimately fail, in my view. Uh, and evangelicalism is kind of, uh, for better or for worse, going to be the new face of, like, permanently of conservative Christianity. Um, just point because earlier, To your point earlier, the average Catholic is uh, a Mexican. Per pretty much, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because but... in, in any instance, I, I cover this before, in any instance, your average Catholic is only um, as likely to vote Democrat or Republican as the average person of whatever ethnic group they're a part of is. So, you know, if you're a white Catholic um, and, you know, white people vote Demo uh, Republican to, de to Democrat 60-40, then you're only going to vote Republican. Your chances of voting Republican are 60-40. But then if you're a white evangelical, then your chances of voting Republican are like, 80 20 or like 90 10 really like you're 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 much more likely to vote republican and you're definitely more right wing almost certainly on a number of issues there are plenty of catholics who are like literally they're 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 like the there there's a pro life wing of the democratic party and it's basically entirely comprised of catholics uh, of white catholics so anyway um, it's surprising. I would have expected to be like uh, some kind of appeal to the recent immigrants from like the places where the sensibilities are just not the same. No, no, but, it's, it's, it's it's just uh, that's that's the thing about Catholicism. It's it's just so like institutionalized. It's mm. really more of a a cult. You know, it it's really more of a cultural background thing than it is a, a lived religion. Um. Anyway. This easy access to establishment circles and appropriate this is and again this is why they're so well th this is why they have this access to establishment circles is because they're fundamentally inoffensive. Um, this this easy access mm -hmm. to establishment circles and appropriation of post liberal rhetoric by establishment politicians make many in the dissident right and even some others in the more mainstream third new right suspicious of the post liberals. Many sense, correctly in some cases, that they are crypto liberals trying to appeal to conservative principles, and their theory amounts to little more than vibes. In Britain, David Cameron's Big Society is a perfect example of this, advertised as a return to grassroots friendly societies and mutual aid when. Uh, it actually involves bankrolling corrupt NGOs to spread woke hegemony even more than Blair ever did. The basic premise of post-liberalism, there's even a, uh, there's a um, new polity. We'll talk about post-liberalism. Um, best outlined in Patrick, 
Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed, is that liberalism, which it defines as an atomized individualism in both economics and culture, has created many modern problems, not just around woke, but also around family breakdown and the rapid rise in mental illness. This is because liberalism is based on a false belief in individuals being the primary unit of society, needing to consent to any community obligations through social, the social contract. Yeah, it definitely tries to intellectualize things too much, and it sort of scones from less palatable claims about people and politics by making by turning everything into these sort of distant, abstract, philosophical problems. Not this is not even to say that the analysis is wrong entirely, but you can tell they're kind of avoiding things. Post liberals see this as false. Humans have always lived in groups, and using the state to promote excessive individualism destroys the fabric of family and community. Therefore, society should reemphasize community and reciprocal obligations, with social contract replaced with a social covenant of common rootless rootedness and belonging. This idea that our modern problems stem from an excess of individualism in both economics and culture, and what that we need to return to a more communitarian spirit, is what unites post-liberals. But aside from this, it is a very broad tradition, with some barely even qualifying as right-wing, and others advocating for Catholic theocracy. Yeah, a, this is a, an essentially uh, Catholic movement. Um, the especially a yeah. Yeah, they're just Democrats, but you know they don't like the Eastern comic blocks of statics, so they would like to build a like a cathedral, maybe in yeah. between the comic blocks. Yeah, pretty much. I'll discuss four factions of post-liberalism as they as the first entry in my analysis of all factions of the rightosphere. British post-liberals, man, we are at thirty. Yeah, we're at half an hour. We'll keep going. This will be a long stream. Um, you finish this with is... these, and the judge should be fine. What was that? Like episode. Probably like finish the post liberals, and uh, that would be fine for like episode one. Obviously, we're gonna make, make it a series. Yeah, we can go on to the next one some other time. This is, by yeah. virtue of its name, predominantly British. However, it is not exclusively so. With some American intellectuals like Christopher Lash occupy. Turn off. Christopher Latch oc a bit. Okay. occupying a similar position. However, it is nowhere near as prominent in the United States, and almost all post liberals over there are conservative Christians of some description, mostly Catholic. British post liberals are a mostly secular movement, though many have private religious belief. They mourn the passing of the post war consensus. The, communica the communitarian post-1945 and pre-Thatcher Britain. 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 They are mostly economically left-leaning, but suspicious of centralization, endorsing something similar to a British variant of Christian democracy. They can be either one of the two main parties. Blue Labour represents the Labour wing, and the Tory wing is represented by think tanks like Res Publica and New Social Covenant Union, a unit who claim the mantle of Benjamin Disraeli. He's the original One Nation conservative. Um, and Harold Macmillan. Even though the, originally most of its theorists were on the left, it is more comfortable in conservative circles these days due to labor's wokeism. Uh, intellectuals of this faction include Matthew Goodwin, David Goodhart, John Gray, John Milbank, Sebastian Milbank, Adrian Pabst, Philip Blonde, Maurice Gil Glasman, Danny Kruger, William Clouston, and Paul Embry. Um, in terms of minor um, of minor parties, the modern Social Democratic Party (SDP), led by William Clouston, which is economically left wing, communitarian, and nationalist, while not being overtly religious, is its primary representative. Is this the? Uh... Interesting. Sort of like left conservative in a sense. Uh, not that they, this party has any relevancy, though. Um, in terms of literature, Adrian Papp's post liberal politics 
Boris Glasman's Blue Labor, A Politics of the Common Good, and Danny Kruger's Covenant are a good summary of the ideas and overall tone of this tendency. British post-liberalism has been criticized as an inherently nostalgic and reactionary vision, just vibes easily appropriated by mainstream British politicians like Theresa May, Liz, Lisa Nandy, and Keir Starmer. Fair criticism. However, I include it because it is an important tendency within the still young British conservative movement, represented by outlets like The Critic and Unheard, and therefore must be engaged with. All right, Catholic New Dealers. Um, the American post-liberal movement is represented by the... Well, I mean, this is a very, like... They're not really... I, I, I don't know. This guy committed his article to being specifically about America, because the first one... I guess he's, maybe not because he's just literally British post-liberals. But I was like, this isn't very American at all. I don't see these people walking around in your street, on the street in America. Catholic New Dealers must be the uh, American analog. Um, the American post-liberal movement is represented by the triad of free thinkers, Sorab Amari, Patrick Deneen, and Adrian Vermeule, who all represent different strands of the movement. I will separate these strands because whilst all echo familiar themes, I have uh, the backdrop of conservative uh, and have the backdrop of conservative Catholicism, their approach to politics is really quite different. So Rob Amari, as of 2024, represents the faction I like to term the Catholic New Dealers. Up until Obama's presidency, members of this tendency would be fairly comfortable Democrats with Amari in his current form. He frequently charges his views, uh, frequently changes his views fitting in the very well with Catholic Democrats like Bob Casey Sr., Gene Taylor, and Dan Lipinski. This faction is economically left-wing. They support a strong federal government, protecting workers' rights, and providing a social safety net, strong tariffs, and industrial policy. Whilst anti-open borders, they believe in a multicultural working class coalition being the vanguard of the anti-woke revolution. I mean, in a sense... One could argue this is an inevitability, but uh, they portray themselves as champions of the anti-woke common man against the woke rich, with them explicitly blaming neoliberal policies like free trade, open borders, and anti-trade union policies for the rise of woke. So they have a sort of class analysis or attribution to the rise of wokeness rather than a yeah, racial it's closer to like Christian. Uh, I don't. I don't know what like the proper term would be, Christian communists. Um, hmm. It's basically a le the left, but with like a Christian coat of paint. Hmm. Um, they are also prepared to work across the aisle with Amar. Oh boy, yeah, with Amari praising Joe Biden's economic policies. What are you doing, bro? Absolutely not. This is this is BS. And criticizing key right wing figures like Elon Musk and Neil Gorsuch, despite their anti wokeness, for being anti woker. Yeah, this is terrible. Uh, since around we uh, no no friends to the left, no enemies to the right. Um, since around 2022, they have distanced themselves from other factions due to disappointment in the most of the third new rights continued hostility to full scale social democracy, and being very hostile to a new fusionism that reduces the third new right to anti-wokeism. Yeah, that's kind of the other thing. The, the, mm -hmm. their, their, their worldview is not very developed. It's very much just the pure boilerplate surface level anti-woke. Um, yeah, so when it, when it comes to no friends to the left, no enemies to the right, uh, that's, a, that's a good like guiding principle, but... Uh, in any, in any kind, kind of, of implementation, they're going to need to be enemies to the right because otherwise we're just going to get overrun by groypers. Well, that's the thing. I mean, excluded those people are, in my view, quite fringe. So they're they're unpopular and they're they're unpopular with the right, but uh, the the left love them because they can paint the whole right as then like being uh, like rabid neo Nazis. I mean, at this so point, we can, we can pretty much just characterize them as left wing now because they literally are. They're so black pilled. They they're they're vo they're voting for Kamala. Like they're not even like. Okay, but like it, it's, the Groypers aren't the only problem. It's like th there's a there's many elements that uh, 
we would be do we would do best to kind of keep out of the public spotlight. I can kind of. Agree we don't with need that. to. We don't need to disavow them like with any like uh, especially strong language. We don't we, we don't need to throw them to the left, but we kind of need to he- hide them in the basement. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that. They, well, that they'd still be friends in that sense, but it's like the autistic friend that you just don't talk about. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, the 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 chick repellent friend. Uh, however, despite their left wing economics and criticism of excessive focus on anti woke. They are still socially conservative. They are very pro life. Yeah, this is see, this is this is more of the Catholic, the pro right, the pro, the Democrat uh, pro life Catholic faction is probably susceptible to falling into this group. They are very pro life, support a complete ban on all pornography, and frequently condemn euthanasia and assisted dying. I had a teacher who was um in uh, in college who was he converted to Anglicanism because being Catholic was too conservative for him, but uh he he basically fell into this group. He was um I think he's more or less pro life, uh probably opposed to porn, and then also uh would have been against euthanasia. Uh although these people are always they're moderate to the point of never really understanding of like what they're playing with, because playing with the left is playing with fire. Um they are anti-LGBT, but see that only as one part of a socially conservative worldview. Yeah, they don't view the sort of LGBT as being like the main. They don't. They don't. They don't view it as as significant as it actually is. If you know what I mean. Individuals representing this tension. Yeah. Um, Individuals representing this tendency right include. This, uh, what was that? I I think we place undue importance on the the like homosexual problem. It's it is a problem and it should not be ignored, but I think it's not really the it's not a disease, it's a symptom. And it needs to be treated as such. Uh I don't know. I think because it's gotten into school systems, it, it very much mm. deserves a cause because I, I hear people at my at my job talking about how their kids are now suddenly wanting to identify as this or that. I think it is a real because it has such a grip on the youth, that's why it's worth paying attention to. Um Anyway. We need to pay attention to it, but um, I I, th- I think we're wrongly identifying it, or it's getting like misidentified for what it is. Anyway, individuals representing this tendency include Amari, Vance, interesting, Matthew Schmitz, Daryl E. Paul, Bantyar Ungar Sargon, Jeff Schullenberger, and Eudaimonia, husband of Shoe on Head. What you mean, uh? Armored Skeptics now calling himself Eudaimonia? What? Strange match, I know. Uh, Compact Magazine is the primary outlet where this tendency presents its ideas. In another era, they would have very comfortably be on the left, and Amara's book Tyranny, Inc. did get some grudging praise from socialist left publications like Jacobin and Sublation. However, because the American left today is so utterly uncompromising on social issues, as demonstrated by Chris Murphy's Twitter poll, People like Amari are fighting a lost cause. They will either surrender completely on social issues and become uh, indistinguishable from leftists or get nowhere. I agree with that. These people are kind of kind of don't know what's going on. Populist Christian Democrats. Okay. Uh, this group of post-liberals are more comfortably part of the modern Republican coalition. Like the Catholic New Dealers, in historical terms, they would be Democrats though early 20th century rather than New Deal era, being more Jeffersonian compared to Hamilton to the Hamiltonianism of the New Deal the of the Catholic New Deal or Dune of the Catholic New Dealer faction. This populist wing of the GOP completes the 120 year party switch, with people like Josh Hawley channeling some of the same sentiments as Democrats like Andrew Jackson and William Jennings Bryan. This is really sort of an early populist right um or or the the people who have been handed the torch of the early populist right uh patrick deneen outlined this vision in his book regime change unlike the catholic new dealers that are pro centralization in a franklin roosevelt type fashion deneen focuses a lot on subsidiary uh sub- subsidiarity 
making him an old school Christian Democrat rather than a socially conservative social Democrat than Amari arguably is. Josh Hawley, who is a devout Christian but not Catholic, also subscribes to this tendency and wrote an article in Compact titled Christian Democracy for America. Deneen is sympathetic to the Anti-Federalists, those who were opposed to the ratification of the Constitution in 1789, and many of their proposals, as well as adopting some of the views of William Jennings Bryan, like having workers and farmers representatives on the board of the Federal Reserve. Kind of based there. Um, in Compact Magazine, the flagship publication of the Catholic New Dealers, Hamilton Craig, wrote an article unfavorably comparing the types of populism of different wings, seeing people like himself as akin to Teddy Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party. That makes sense. And accusing people like Joss Hawley of being Wilsonians. This has some truth to it, though the fact that Teddy Roosevelt is almost universally revered and Wilson almost universally, universally reviled gives it a pejorative charge. Uh, unlike the Catholic New Dealers, who sometimes sound identical to the left on economic issues, populist Christian Democrats are still clearly on the right. Um, they understand the inevitability of elites, and instead of promoting left-wing talking points, explicitly state that they want to replace the current woke elite with a socially conservative elite, based. Uh, on economics, they are effectively want a slightly more economically right-wing, socially conservative version of post-war German ordo-liberal ordo liberalism with decentralization of decision-making and a rigid class structure, but one where all classes work in social harmony. The populist Christian Democrats tend to be very enthusiastic supporters of Viktor Orban's Hungary, based, whereas Amorite Catholic New Dealist factions tend to prefer Poland's Law and Justice Party uh, when they were in power, representing the different emphases. I don't really think that Law and Justice is... I mean, I guess it's definitely more Catholic than Orban's Hungary, but Law and Justice is still pretty right-wing. Um, I mean, Orban is, is a Protestant at the end of the day, so like he, I, I, doubt I doubt he's going hard. to lead his party to, be, to take any like hard, uh, hard Catholic stances. Especially like the the east of Hungary is full of atheists and uh, former uh, sorry former Protestants and current Protestants, uh, so yeah, those elements kind of need to taper the temp. Uh, they they serve to moderate the Catholicism in Hungary, mm. but in terms of like, they they they're based in the sense not the, not the Hungarians but like these guys in the sense that they do want like a based leader but I, I think they do not understand uh, what the problem is like the problem isn't that we don't have any based leaders it's that the whole structure is antithetical to having a based leader yeah yeah i agree oh it also does feel like this is a little bit of a i'm not saying it's wholly inaccurate but like these people do not call themselves populist christian democrats like it feels like a little bit of a contrived identity um Anyway, uh, in addition to Patrick Deneen and Josh Hawley, other individuals that would fall under this tendency include Gladden Pappin, Philip Pilkington, R.R. Reno, and Rod Dreher. I don't, I, I don't recognize those first three names, and I'm not even really familiar with Rod Dreher there. Miriam Cates would be a British representative of it. Publications falling under this tendency include First Things and the Substack Post-Liberal Order. Oh, man, we're like literally citing Substacks for this. Yeah, this is a very small group of people. Um, I think lastly, we're on to the uh, high integralists. High integralists. This is the faction of American post-liberalism represented by Adrian Vermeule. The high integralists distinguish as high because the other American post-liberals are sometimes described as integralist, are far more openly theocratic. Excuse me, and explicit and their desire for a centralized Catholic state where Catholicism would have favored status as the one true faith. Highly cringe. Highly cringe. Integralism, of course, is like reminiscent of uh, certain movements in the 1930s. Um, this, is, this is the end goal of every Christian 
uh, church, like Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. It's it's a bit of a myth that like the Protestants have uh, this kind of inclusivity and tolerance when it comes to religion. Well, it's like, there's just that's a specific uh, development of the Baptist movement, because Baptists were hispo- historically very persecuted by uh, other denominations. So they're the, they're. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 I, I see what you're saying in the sense that, like, any sort of mainline or Catholic or, uh, you know, Orthodox, whatever, would want every, their own variation of integralism. But, like, it, it, you know, the sort of, oh, we want a secular state, but we're Christian is a very Baptist thing. Um, the, the Catholics push for it. Uh, the Catholics and their derivatives push for it especially hard because uh, this idea of Rome kind of permeates itself down. And the, the successors never really shook that off, at least initially. Later down the line, some branches did. They did evolve the religious tolerance because they failed to impose their will. But um, no, every every single Protestant Reformation started with uh, wanting to make their own Catholic Church. But this much, time, yeah. like correctly. Yeah, I mean, I really, you really to you can't you can't. I really think it is a contradiction too to be a Christian and then wanting to support. Uh, and then, like, ultimately, in like an abstract sense, wanting to support a, a secular state, like, there's a there, there might be a sort of tactical utility to it, given um, given whatever whatever political or historical circumstance you may be in, but ultimately, you would want a, a state that sort of works in a synthesis with the church. Um, but a lot of evangelicals yeah, who are the, uh, where, even um, even evangelicalism generally has has inherited this tendency from the Baptist movement. A lot of evangelicals will still kind of cuck to the uh, uh, we ju- we actually are pro secularism idea, even though it all, it's ultimately working against them. What were you going to say? No, the or- I was going to say like the Orthodox churches aren't exactly anti secular states because. Um, the idea within like orthodoxy is that like the state and the church are supposed to have a partnership, um, but isn't there in, a specific in reality, word? I was just say, isn't there a specific yeah, word for that? There is. I'm forgetting it right now. It starts with. But an in S. effect, it... it's been bugging me for months. I know there's a specific word for it, and I like I can't. I, I, I know I read about it somewhere. There's I, I, I can't think of it. There's a specific word that starts with an S that refers to the historical relationship of the the Orthodox Church and the Russian state. And it's going to bug me until the day I die. Gosh darn it. Anyway, sorry for derailing. Uh, in addition to Vermeule, their worldview is represented by the substack The American Post Liberal, with frequent contributors being Luca Adomo, and William Benson. Vermeule likes the idea of the Supreme Court imposing a vision of morality, with him heavily criticizing the doctrine of originalism. He just wants it to be Catholicism instead of liberalism, his common good constitutionalism, a mirror image of the living constitution. He believes the law needs to make more value judgments that the left does not, that the left does, but the right does not. For instance, Vermeule is critical of Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization for only returning the matter of abortion to elected officials and not banning it across the United States on the basis of the sanctity of life is non-negotiable, regardless of popular will, like liberals did with same-sex marriage. Yeah, so um, uh, th- these people are kind of non-optical in that sense. You know, you're never going to get a, a nationwide ban of that. Um, at least not yet. I found the word. Okay. What was that? I found the word. I found the word. It's uh, it's in phone. Yeah. Drop it in the chat. Anyway, the high integralists very much believe in state-imposed mandated morality to a much greater degree than other post-liberals on the basis that freedom to sin is not real freedom. And if the state has the duty to save people from eternal damnation, they would endure for, for not being Catholic. Almost based except for the being Catholic part. Uh, they outline a plan to, like Constantine in the Roman Empire, turn the United States into a majority Catholic country with all of the same Machiavellian tactics. 
They may sound far-fetched, but they have a very sophisticated elite feel, which indicates they will be a force to be to be to reckon with in the coming decades. This could be true, especially because um, most migration to the U.S. is from Hispanic countries, which are obviously Catholic in background. So these people could have a lot of in, potentially have a lot of influence in the future, especially if they're willing if they're willing or able to draw from. Uh, Hispanic constituencies. Uh, conclusion: Post liberals are not a very online. Post liberals are not a very online movement. They exist primarily in establishment circles. I agree. They are treated very favor- favorably by the mainstream liberal press in comparison to other factions, despite the extremism of Adrian Vermeule's high integralist faction. Even though the high integralists share similarities with the Christian Caesarist faction of the dissident right. There is generally not very much interaction between integralists and the neo-reactionary crowd, with the integralists seeing such tendencies as beneath them. Academic agent. Oh man, he even talked about academic agent. Wow, crazy. Did an uh, did an unfortunately now paywall good podcast episode analyzing the various post liberals. In addition to Patrick Casey's Twitter thread, shows you the very clear line between post liberals and more race focused sections of the right. I hope you enjoyed reading this first entry of Factions of the Rightosphere. Please like, follow, and share. Okay, so that's it for this reading of Factions of the Rightosphere and our commentary on it. I hope you enjoyed it. This is almost an hour now. Uh, Big Cheese, any closing thoughts? These are the demos. Um, as the wind, if as the wind shifts, I think they will mostly be killed off. Um, metaphorically if not literally i agree i think the future of the right ultimately lies in the manosphere um, yeah it lies in the manosphere but the problem is that um and this is this is what what's probably gonna uh preserve them someone does need to man the bureaucracy no matter how small it becomes yeah well that's kind of what's happening the, these, now because because as, yeah. as this person even admits they're not an online movement but they have favorability in elite circles these are these people are essentially just elites who come from specific ethnic or religious backgrounds that prevent them from being full progressives yeah um the rhinos that's i mean okay i i kind of agree i, I don't know i think i think but... actual rhinos are like atheistic kind of uh neoliberal Reaganites, if you will. These people are potential. They're very squishy and shouldn't be fully trusted. Although I think, uh, I think there is a utility in dialogue with them or not totally slamming the door on them, if you know what I mean. There, there's some. They are a group we need to kind of maintain a cordial relations uh, relationship with, but also. Uh, the bureaucracy should be minimized so that their influence is minimized. Yeah. I, I agree. Anyway, that's it for this video. This is the first entry of um, the uh, Factions of the Rightosphere. If you'd like to hear another, this has been Red Channels and the Big Cheese. Uh, comment down below on your with your thoughts. And we will catch you in the next one.